Greetings from the campus of Soka University of America in Aliso Viejo, California. My name is Ian Reed. I'm Associate Professor of Latin American Studies and co-director of the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights. Soka University was founded on Buddhist principles and offers a secular and rigorous liberal arts curriculum that stresses peace, human dignity, and the sanctity of life. It is my great honor to introduce this event titled Afro-Pessimism and its others. Our acclaimed speaker, Dr. Hortense J. Spillers and our distinguished moderator, Dr. Lewis R. Gordon. I welcome and thank the hundreds of audience members who, that join us today, representing more than 30 countries. This global event would not be possible without the support of President Edward Fiesel, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Michael Weiner, and the Soko High SUA's Undergraduate Alumni Association. To our many alumni joining us today, it is good to have you back in a shared space of value creation. I know another large group of our audience is here because of Julesy, who has helped us promote this event. Please check out Julesy's organization, Smart Brown Girl, and the remarkable book club she, she manages. The mission of the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights is to provide space and resources for students and faculty of Soka University of America to engage in inquiry, research, and constructive dialogue related to race, ethnicity, human rights, and their intersections. An initiative in 2020 by President Fiesel created the center, along with my co-director and Vice President of Mission Integration, Kevin Moncrief, and the students and faculty fellows of the center. We've worked to implement the commitment of SUA's founder, Daisaku Ikeda, to global citizenship, respect for human diversity, equality, and human rights. A few words about the event structure. Following Dr. Spiller's talk, Dr. Gordon will moderate a discussion. Audience members are encouraged to post their questions and remarks using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Hortense J. Spillers, the Rare Center's Distinguished Faculty Fellow, has been a foundational figure and a critical voice in feminist theory, as well as American, African-American, Caribbean, literary, and historical, cultural, and philosophical studies since the 1970s. Dr. Spellers is Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. Since receiving her PhD from Brandeis University, she has taught or been a visiting scholar at Wellesley and Haverford Colleges and at Emory, Cornell, Duke, and Free Universities. Dr. Spillers has received numerous honors and awards, among them grants from the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, as well as fellowships from the National Humanities Center, Research Triangle, and Center for the Study of Behavior Sciences. She's authored or edited numerous books, including Black, White, and In Color, Essays on American Literature and Culture. She continues to gain many admirers, including via YouTube with her classic essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. This landmark 1987 article is one of the most cited in African-American literary studies. At Vanderbilt, Dr. Spillers founded the A-Line Journal, an independent online magazine that examines national and international issues from a progressive stance. The Pembroke Center at Brown University recently called Dr. Spillers one of the most significant Black feminist scholars this observation was recently affirmed by her election, along with Angela Davis and Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak as a 2021 member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. You're also here to, today to honor and celebrate Dr. Spiller's lifetime achievement as a scholar, teacher, and public intellectual. Our event will be moderated by Dr. Lewis R. Gordon, professor and head of the Department of Philosophy the University of Connecticut. Dr. Gordon is a philosopher, political thinker, educator, and musician who achieved his PhD from Yale University. Dr. Gordon is honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies, visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg, and honorary professor at the Unit for the Humanities at Rhodes University, South Africa. In his previous academic positions, he founded the Department of Africana Studies at Brown University and the Center for Afro-Jewish Studies and the Institute for Study of Race and Social Thought at Temple University. 
Dr. Gordon co-edits with Jane Anna Gordon, the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs, the Roman and Littlefield book series, Global Critical Caribbean Thought, and with Rosanna Mart, Epiphania Amu Andre, and Sayan Day, the Rutledge India book series, Academics, Politics and Society in the Post-COVID World. He is author of many books, most recently, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, and the forthcoming On Philosophy, Decolonization, and Race, to be published in Wuhan, China in the fall. Farrar, Strauss, and Giro, and Penguin Publishers will, will publish Fear of Black Consciousness next year, and will appear in German and Portuguese editions, demonstrating his global influence. So when I reached out to Dr. Spillers and Dr. Gordon about his role as moderator, they both used the same word, delighted, reflecting their many years of friendship. A few years ago, Dr. Gordon surveyed the literature of Afro-pessimism. He and two colleagues wrote, the appeal to a black condition is peculiarly existential. Existentialists reject notions of human nature on the grounds that human beings live in worlds they also construct. They produce their so-called essence. That does not mean, however, human beings lack anchorage. Everyone has to start from somewhere. Let us enter that important somewhere. Welcome first, Dr. Spillers. And when I say new slavery studies, I'm talking about studies that are not necessarily carried out by historians. In fact, by naming it thus, I mean precisely not historians, but thinkers who, like historians, tend to be academics who work in the humanities, uh, and other traditional disciplinary form formations like philosophy, the social sciences, and, and so forth. So we could call them, I guess, neo-non-historians uh, who work close to history in those traditional disciplinary formations, but in a parallel or concurrent fashion. In any case, this hybrid practitioner we might even call them after Ralph Ellison, tinker thinkers often inflect their historical understanding through a literary lens, for instance. Not disciplinary purists, these scholarly actors are both symptomatic and causal of the sort of projects that characterize the Humanities Academy from the mid seventies to the turn of the century and after. This work product is eclectic in its methodological moves and its conceptual maneuvers. What it is driving at, it seems to me, is a new historical writing as it seeks to pry in scare quotes theory and theorization from its formal moorings in philosophy. What these discursive and conceptual innovations have conduced to is the sense that theory is not only ubiquitous, but that it traverses an orbit of interrogations that give us the widest possible understanding of culture. A culturally inflected study of slavery would not challenge or eschew the conclusions that historians would draw, but would rather probe the implications of certain conclusions. For example, what social and cultural difference does it make that the status of children born under the regime of US slavery essentially rewrites the logics of kinship and parenting. In other words, what I am calling the new slavery studies do not only reinforce our status as students of history, how, for example, 
part of sequitur Wintram works, but it also widens our grasp of slavery in its totality of meaning in what I would call its definitive anthropomorphic character, its symbolic, semantic, and poetic signatures. Afro-pessimism takes up the afterlife of slavery. Slavery as it enters spatio-temporal contexts assumed to be beyond its social economies. But before we get there, I want to raise a few critical questions about its origins, story, narrative, and what its discursive relationship might be to thought movement concurrent with it. At the moment, Black Studies, whether it operates as its own curricular object or whether it disperses across the human sciences, chooses between, or I should say more precisely, navigates between two major conceptual channels or currents. There's Blackness on the one hand and Africanity on the other. Blackness arises in the modern West as the racialized perception of reality. We could call it the coming of Blackness, which from this angle is a very different condition from Africanity, which overlaps Blackness but is hardly synonymous with it. Perhaps it is not a mere accident that the impulses that will covet Black personality as a source of early capitalist wealth are exacerbated in the 15th century, which one thinker has called the century of the other, 1492, for example, the year of the first Spanish grammar. It is also the year that or one of the years that opens the Americas to European exploration and incursion. But it is also the year of the Iberian expulsion of Jewish communities from the peninsula. 50 years prior, the transatlantic slave trade opens with the import of African peoples into the city of Lisbon this gesture would instaurate, as we know, one of the most impactful developments in human history. Africanity does not so much disavow the powerful implications of blackness and the African diaspora as one of its products, but we could say that Africanity overwrites it. In other words, Afrocentrism as I understand it, argues that Blackness is not only a kind of misrecognition or misprision insofar as it is limited in its temporal reach, but it is a vast deception in as much as African life and thought begin centuries before the Atlantic slave trade and recede toward human infinity, which is African at the source. These conceptual channels like great waterways that accommodate ocean going vessels of various size and purpose shoot out or emanate various paradigms or styles of thought that take up a repertoire of projects from soup to nuts. But I think it is fair to say that what all these punctualities have in common is that th they are situated implicitly or otherwise in one or the other of these underlying conceptual dispositions. Afro-pessimism is only one of these paradigms, but so pervasive in its presence that even some practitioners who are said to be Afro-pessimists are not. Afro-pessimists. From time to time, I have received email queries from graduate students, usually uh, young women whom I don't know, wanting me to say whether or not I am an Afro-pessimist, 
or not, since some of their classmates had argued in class one day that uh, I was an Afro-pessimist. Well, I want to say uh, for the record that I am not an Afro-pessimist, but I think I understand why an interlocutor might think so, and that might have something to do with what I would call the Afro-pessimist effect that works like this. That's because the conceptual channel that I traverse is subtended by blackness as an implied value. Though I understand very well the kinship between blackness and Africanity. I would say that I might start in the same place or a similar place to the Afro-pessimists, and that is to say at New Slavery Studies as an inaugural critical gesture, but I believe that my work ultimately reaches other conclusions from that of the Afro-pessimists. And I think a little test one might want to run if you ever were interested in doing that is to check out uh, the closure of several of those essays. I mean, the, the, the rhetorical gesture that I make in, in Mama's Baby and Terstices, all the things you could be, the permanent obliquity of an infallibly straight, blackness, a uh, post-date, uh, all of those essays really gesture toward uh, a future or futurity. And I would say in, in, in that regard, they draw, I believe, a, a different conclusion from the conclusions uh, that the, that the Afro-pessimists uh, would draw. But I suppose we could, uh, we could talk about that point uh, further if anybody wanted to, I uh, wanted to do that. Afro-pessimism accords pride of conceptual place to Orlando Patterson's social death, which becomes a cardinal feature of Afro-pessimist claims. Because slavery and social death is so key a text to these arguments, I have returned to it for uh, a brief consideration in this talk. In 2018, Harvard University Press brought out uh, a new edition of Slavery and, and Social Death with a new preface where Professor Patterson uh, reviews some of his own predecessors, including uh, Max Weber, Moses Finley, the French Annal School of Historians that include, as you know, uh, historians like uh, Brodel, Arias, uh, and, and others. He also considers in considerable detail uh, the cross-disciplinary reach of his 1982 work, quite specifically, the fate of social death in the, theories, in, in the theorizations of scholars as divergent uh, in their aims as Judith Butler and Abdul John Muhammad. He also talks about uh, his own work prior to slavery and social death. Uh, among them, uh, I was interested to learn, was a 1972 novel called uh, Die, the Long Day, which is um, a story about an enslaved Jamaican woman and her daughter and the mother's attempts to uh, circumvent the slave master's uh, designs on, uh, on the daughters. Anyway, in uh, Professor uh, Patterson's commentary on Afro-pessimism, he notes that the invocation of social death by these public intellectuals, and let me stop there to point out that in, in the footnote associated with this uh, particular uh, observation, he specifically notes uh, the work of the following uh, practitioners, uh, Sadia Hartman, Frank Wilderson, Fred Moten, Calvin Warren, 
and Jared Sexton among uh, the public intellectuals uh, that he is talking about uh, in this address. The invocation of social death by these public intellectuals is not something from which I recoil. To the contrary, he goes on, in both my scholarship and my public intellectual work, I have long argued for the persistence of the effects of slavery in American culture and society. Typical of my position is the following statement written some 20 years ago. Quote, the 13th Amendment abolished the individual ownership of one person by another, but did not remove the culture and institutional system of slavery. Indeed, in many respects, these were compensatorily reinforced, making life more precarious and frighteningly oppressive for Afro-Americans, end of quote. Patterson lays out as many members of the audience will recall, three constitutive elements of enslavement. And this descriptive trio reemerges in successive theorizations one way or another. In this relation of domination, Patterson argues, perhaps, quote, the most distinctive attribute of the slave's powerlessness was that it always originated or was conceived of as having originated as a substitute for death, usually violent death. And that is from the introduction to the book. The second constitutive element of the slave relation was, quote, the slave's natal alienation, the loss of ties of birth in both ascending and descending generations. The, stir, the third constitutive element is that the slave is always, quote, dishonored in a generalized way. On the level of the personal relations, uh, Patterson argues, slavery is the permanent, violent domination of natally alienated and generally dishonored persons, end of quote. But slavery was also an institutional process as well as a personal relations. As an interlocutor, I do not uh, disagree with any of the constitutive elements that Patterson evolves, though I would invite or welcome at some point an inquiry into social psychology as a privileged window onto the question of human need. As I do not doubt that the enslaved person is dishonored in relation to an empowered other, that the enslaved is vulnerable to be uprooted from his, her kin ties, and that the enslaved in certain historical circumstance was a prisoner of war and conquest but the prisoner was not killed. He was taken captive instead. Are these constitutive elements arbitrary? And by arbitrary, I'm asking how an order of priority and succession among them is determined. Does the death portion pass down the generations? For instance, concerning the slave demographies in reference uh, to the new world, I'm not aware that these captives over many centuries were enslaved as a result of military conquest. This might actually cause some slippage in the death thematic if we are advancing that as an ironclad rationale for the state of enslavement. Are these constitutive elements too absolute in their passage from Patterson to other theorizations and other practitioners? 
I wonder what conclusions an investigator might draw if she or he examined concepts of power as they are articulated in slavery and social death against the Foucauldian reading of power or Barbara Hernstein Smith's contingencies of value, for example. What I am suggesting here is that what seems to me a nearly deterministic persuasion that grows out of the application of Patterson's work might be checked or placed in perspective if read against other currents of thought. It seems to me that the question of whether or not slavery exceeds its given temporal frame and that is probably among the most complicated questions that we could pose, does not give way to an answer with a binary shape, a yes or a no, an either or. But I'd argue that the response is fashioned as a both and. In other words, there is no choosing, as I read it, as I understand it, between what I would call slavery as eventuality and slavery as horizon. It is both unavoidably. The way we answer this question, more precisely the route of response one adopts in addressing it goes far in deciding one's disposition toward Afro-pessimism. In part two, of this lecture in June, I hope to double back on this problematic. <clears throat> the term Afro-pessimism resurfaces post-millennium from its provenance, and if not its provenance, then certainly an earlier iteration of it than its US uh, usage. It looks like it's, its provenance or it's an earlier iteration of it uh, travels back to the 1980s in another context altogether. And I want to talk a little bit uh, about that as I move uh, toward uh, the, the end of this talk. Some time ago, in, in reference to Professor uh, Wilderson's uh, Red, White, and Black, I ran across a reference to Afro-pessimism in connection with the language of development in the context of Sub-Saharan African communities. But as we do sometimes when we are moving too fast, I failed uh, to make a note of uh, the source uh, that I was reading. And I want to stop and thank right here, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Marzia Malazzo for bringing uh, to my notice information that helped me to retrieve this lost connection. It is noteworthy that Afro-pessimism belongs to the discourse of policy analysis in this particular instance, and that ironically, it could possibly find itself the subject of critique among US Afro-pessimists today. In any case, here is an instance of the other language of Afro-pessimism from an article written shortly before the turn of the century by David Reif, who is a policy analyst and whose work focuses on immigration and international conflict. In 1998, David Reif published an article entitled In Defense of Afro-Pessimism that appeared in the World Policy Journal, the winter 1998 uh, issue of that journal in response to David F. Gordon's and Howard Wolpe's the Other Africa and Into Afro-Pessimism, which also appeared in the World <clears throat> Policy Journal, spring 1998. What these articles demonstrate is the position taking among policy analysts and state actors 
regarding the trend line of African development after what I call the heroic age, the years of decolonization and independence of which Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana offers an example. <clears throat> what had begun with great optimism for the promise of the sub-Saharan continent from 1957 on had by the late 1970s, according to Reef, given way to an ingrained pessimism about Africa's future. He goes on, this gloom soon became pervasive, not only among Africans themselves, but among the continent's well-wishers and advocates abroad. In reading that passage, I wondered if we detect early warning signs in a passage like that of this pessimistic disposition in aspects of Richard Wright's uh, Black Power, um, written even before Ghanaian independence, as celebratory as that work is, we also recall that uh, there were uh, certain moments of skepticism or, or pessimism in, in Wright's view of the matter. In, in any case, uh, grounded in sub-Saharan uh, Africa's post-colonial realities, Afro-pessimism examined in detail all the indices having to do with questions of sustainability, life expectancy, food security, educational enrollments, agricultural production, debt levels, the extent of international corporate investment. Generally speaking, the Afro-pessimists, according to Reef, concluded that, quote, the Western model of modernization was inappropriate in its application to African realities. Reef draws a contrast between the Afro-pessimists and the Afro-optimists, to which camp, he contends, Bill Clinton and his government's Africa policy belonged. The Clintonites embraced notions of an African Renaissance and a general sense of African possibility on the one hand, while on the other, the pessimists maintained that Africa would be, quote, enormously difficult to help. The institutions and nations that wish to help Africa are, quote, themselves weak. In summarizing uh, this argument, I would, I would make the following points. In summary, Africa is marginal, these are Reef's words here, to the geostrategic concerns of most important rich countries and marginal to the economic concerns of most multinational corporations, except those engaged in oil extraction or mining. In short, while levels of development assistance continue to fall and the levels of African indebtedness continue to rise, foreign private investment is not taking up the slack and foreign political engagement is intermittent and inconsistent. In Reef's opinion, in the world of the late 20th century, what was needed in the African case was paradoxically the very thing not likely to occur, and that is to say the outbreak of solidarity and compassion among the rich nations. And it was this last that would render, he felt, Afro-pessimism unwarranted. We note with considerable interest the extent to which this language smacks of the assurance of the patron, the benefactor, 
just as Afro-pessimism, according to Reef, is based on the negative claim that U.S. aid has been wasted. So I would ask in closing, what do we make of these predecessor moments of Afro-pessimism, even if we could posit no category of alignment between these moves that come off the same locution? We are nonetheless compelled to regard, not too comfortably, I would suggest the rhetorical shadow that is thrown over the latter-day Afro-pessimism by its earlier iteration. I would also uh, like to pose for further study this question. Does the very concept of pessimism spring from philosophies of European exhaustion. We might want to think about the Oswald Spengler, Arnold Toynbee alignment of thinkers in trying to determine where this gloominess starts. And we might ask how opposite it might be to other historical formations and dispositions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hortense. To the audience, to everybody who is here, I'd like to begin first with saying Wanikisuk and Halito. Wanikisuk is Wampanoag and Halito is Choctaw. Uh, we're in Unlands where this is a discussion taking place among the indigenous peoples. And the Wampanoag, as we know, were those who greeted the pilgrims um, to their misfortune. I'd also like to say Avanikan to the people of India who are going through so much right now. And also in terms of our ancestors, Hotep, and if we go to Shalom, Assalamu Alaikum, there's so many ways in which to say peace. It's striking that we begin often when we meet people with the word peace. And I say this mainly because it already shows that there are societies in which there is this question of what do you come with? Do you come in peace? I also would like to add that when we think in terms of when we're here and the complicated questions that Professor Spiller has just uh, introduced, we are here in a relationship in which it's often forgotten that there are ancestors through whom we become descendants. And if we abdicate the role or the commitment of becoming ancestors. And I don't mean biologically, I mean, it could be intellectually, it could be affectively. Ultimately, this decision to be ancestors requires descendants. It requires what transcends us. Now, I open with this because as you could see from Professor Spiller's presentation, Professor Spillers isn't didactic. And what I mean by that is she was speaking as a student because ultimately that's what great researchers are. They're people who continue to learn because they fell in love with learning. And this ongoing learning is exemplified in many of her essays because the arguments that connect them are, S are arguments of embodied fluidity that transcends disciplinary decadence. And I bring up disciplinary decadence because that point at the end about pessimism is linked to nihilism. And what scholars of nihilism would remind us is that nihilism 
and pessimism are symptomatic. They tend to be symptoms of a form of decay. But if one, and it's usually a form of decay that begins to fetishize death and force as expressions of power. Now, uh, like Professor Spillers, I receive a lot of letters about Afro-pessimism as well. And part of it is because of the way Afro-pessimists use my work. And I've received letters, including from high school debate teams. And this is, and part of this is because for some reason, quite a number of high school debate teams, particularly urban debate teams, are given Afro-pessimist literature to debate. And it's rather striking. They're not given to boys. They're not given Angela Davis. They're not given Professor Spillers. They're not given Tony Kare Bambara. They're not given Zora Neale Hurston. They're not given Anna Julia Cooper. They're given Frank Wilderson, Sexton, Sidea Hartman and others. And I find it very curious because within the framework, they're often given this without a context. And part of this lecture tonight was to introduce some context. And among the contexts is a confusion of aspirations with outcomes. Many Afro-pessimist analyses, for instance, would examine what would be the aspirations of an anti-Black society. And you notice I said an, because often when they use my work in bad faith and anti-Black racism, when I pose the question of what, is the, what are the aspirations of an anti-Black society, many Afro-pessimists turn that into the world is anti-Black. And so that's a confusion with an aspiration as an outcome. But there are also other distinctions that are crucial and we saw some of this in the lecture because there's a distinction between blacks or Africans and they're not identical. Black, it's often we conflate the two, but for now let's talk about blacks who are Africans or African diasporic people who are black. There's a confusion between blacks who are pessimistic versus pessimism as a regulative ideal. And I bring this up just to bring a little point, a little aside, because among the many accolades Professor Spiller is, has is the Nicholas Villian Lifetime Achievement Award winner from the Caribbean Philosophical Association. And when I was um, presiding over conferring that award, one of the things I brought up is that that is an award that emanates from the global south. It's an award that comes from the people who within the framework of Euro modernity are rejected. So there's already something at work with the very ability to build institutions, to build ways of life, but not among those who are le dagne de la terre, the damned of the earth, but at the same time, the valuing of each other. In fact, what I often say when I confer that award is that it's for people who value being valued by those who are rejected. In a way, mama's baby, papa's maybe, the way Alicia Garza would talk about Black Lives Matter as a love letter was also a love song reminding us of what it is to understand ourselves as a source of value rather than simply, as the essay points out, mere flesh. Now, within that framework, optimism and pe pessimism can be critically assessed as ironically two sides of the same coin because their logic is very similar. They're within a framework in which there is an expectation of outcome before performance. So, with that as a context, I'd like to pose some questions to Professor Spillers, and then we go directly to the audience. And um, I've hung up, Hortense and I have a, a, a good history together that I'll always cherish. And that's why I could say Hortense because he's among those I just hold dear to my heart. So I'll begin Hortense with this point 
about, because there's something that always pops up among Afro, the Afro-pessimistic discourse, which is different from the discourse of Blacks who are pessimistic. Mm. Because it's a regulative ideal. They take theory and ontologize theory. And one of the things, of course, is that pessimism and ontology become very strange bedfellows. So I'm curious, especially because you, as a person who transcend methodological and disciplinary reductivism, who transcend, uh, transcend the tendency to deal with forms of epistemic closure, you reach for theoretical resources such as psychoanalysis. And I'm curious what you would have to say about psycho in a psychoanalytical query, and not exclusively that, because as we know, it's never one methodological resource, of Black, the, the notion of Black and Blackness as a fetish in Afro-pessimism. So I'll begin with that one. Blackness as fetish. It, it's funny that you would start there because fetish crossed my mind um, last night or <laughs> the night before uh, very, very briefly. And I guess I would answer it uh, this way. I would think about um, fetish as reification. And it seems to me that what happens with an Afro-pessimistic reading is that Blackness becomes reified, right? I mean, it's an object that is broken away from or breaks away from uh, its, its, its dynamism. And once it once it acts as uh, a fetish, uh, it becomes an idol. But more than that, it becomes what I would call a stop sign, right? It's the place where one stops. It becomes a memorial. Uh, it becomes uh, a place that does not allow movement anymore. I mean, you can uh, you can stop and admire it. And I think that's what, that's what I would call a memorialization. That's what I would also call the profound conservative nature of an Afro-pessimistic disposition. That it takes, for instance, what should be a point of departure as a point of arrival. And I think the best demonstration of that that I can come up with is what happened in the minds of some people once Barack Obama became the president of the United States. It was a moment of closure, right? It was uh, a point of arrival when it should have been a point of departure. It was not a place to stop. It was a place to launch or take off somewhere and i would when you say fetish that's what that's what i that's what i think uh when i think when i think fetish i mean it's it's an object that has broken away from some uh dynamic context or principle or idea it has assumed a life of its own but it's a kind of uh dead hand that it's that it's that it's become, and it's a place where uh, movement. I guess I think of a torque, right? An idea that starts rotation or starts movement. It becomes a place where uh, where where movement where movement stops. And I have been I have been struck by what seems to me. Uh, those 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 moments of closure, if I have understood the rhetoric of some of the practitioners uh, that I'm that I'm reading, I mean, it, 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 they they hit a point where you cannot 
intrude any other idea. I mean, they, they have reached uh, absolute closure. And that's what, that's what, that's what I'm calling a, 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 a conservative or reactive bent or tendency in, in the thinking. Yeah, as you bring that point up, it really strikes me on uh, how it relates, not only to the point you made about history, because Afro-pessimist history is very ahistorical because unfortunately they often make things up. Mm. But, but the other part that becomes rather um, striking is how at a textual level, because as you already know, many are literary theorists as well, though there are some people who also come from philosophy in it. Uh, they build a lot around a very profound misreading of an observation from Frantz Fanon. In Penoir Mass Blanc, Black Skin, White Mass, there's a section in the fifth chapter, L'Experience de Côte de Noir, The Lived Experience of the Black. Mm. And it's unfortunate that the translation, that's why whenever I write on Fernando, I use my own translation. Um, what he actually says, right, is it, the right way it should be translated is from the point of view, because he says in the eyes of, use it metaphorically, from the point of view of the white, the black has no ontological resistance. And it's interesting that Afro-pessimists interpret that literally to mean that Blacks have no ontological resistance. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you yeah. see? Yeah. Not, not an epistemic or a psychoanalytical retreat against the fact of dealing with the complexity of human beings as properly not being. So the ontological arguments they use, what's strange is, although they keep saying the Black is not a being, what they miss is that Fanon's argument is that Euromodern colonialism constructs whites as beings and make being the standard of being human when no human being is a closure. Mm. So that means that in Euromodern colonialism, there's a fear actually of existence. But, mm. if, but if we bring it away from Eurocentric thought, which is one of the things you brought up in your presentation, it's pretty clear that we see here the question of what Du Bois and many others would argue as the first stage of double consciousness, which is seeing yourself through the eyes of those who despise you hmm. without moving to the dialectical relationship to it, which is potentiated critique. In other words, the point of saying there's something wrong with a society that degrades you. So I was curious about this point about ontological resistance because it leads also to other notions like ontological terror. And again, that's really problematic because if the terror is going to be from the white's point of view, because in Afro-pessimism, only white points of view matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would the white actually see it as terror but, but not just simply normal. Mm -hmm. and, and so this raises a rather interesting question because you see in many um, majority black settings, if you look, if one goes into a lot of Southern Africa, the Caribbean, many places, greetings actually treat sight as positive. In Zulu, for instance, sawabona means I see you, which makes absolute sense because in a world in which to encounter another human being, as a welcome is different from the Hobbesian, Euromodern, colonial world in which other human beings are always a threat. Mm -hmm. In other words, the philosophical and psychoanalytical dis distinction between seeing and the look. And so I was curious about that mainly because um, of those two things, how you look at this discourse around sight, double consciousness, and of course, this question of moving beyond Hobbesian models of sovereignty, which with Foucault would look at as governmentality and into the realm of politics, which one could find beyond people like Foucault and others. One could see it in the black intellectual tradition all the way back from Kugano to Fambend 
through Du Bois, all the way through to these questions of political discourse. And so basically, this is a way of saying, uh, to what extent if we have a potentiated critique of those Eurocentric categories, if we start drawing on the fact that black, there is generative, creative black thought, to what extent if we begin to build on that, we begin to raise a question about not only the Eurocentrism of Afro-pessimism, but also the question of the kind of political commitments we need to transcend that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have, I've, I've thought a lot about um, Ralph Ellison and the position of uh, the invisible man and how in um, the, the frame of that novel, Invisible Man speaks about how he says yes and no simultaneously. So that um, it seems to me the paradox of black life is what is most generative about it. And it is, it is the power of yes and no and working at all times. It's a kind of whirlwind, I think, that has to be, that has to be written or mounted. And if you relinquish that, then you fall into these positions of closure that we were talking about a moment ago. I mean, at, at all times, we are simultaneously talking about a both and, and you can, you can never, you can never relinquish any of those, any of those postures. And that's where, that's where the generative juice is coming from. That's what I think the work of theory is in relationship to black life and thought that the, 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 the black thinker is, is trying to work his way out of a dilemma. I mean, it is not uh, simply osseous activity that is, that, is, that is going on here. I mean, he's, he's, he, she is actually trying to work his or her way uh, out of uh, a dilemma, which is never really actually worked out of. So you have to, you have to live with the fact that um, what we have inherited is, is, is a conundrum, right? And what, what is the language that goes along with that? What are the critical dispositions that go along with that? And it seems to me that's where, that's, that's where the generative principle comes from or that torque movement that, that I was talking about a moment ago. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna move now to some of the questions from the audience. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll mix, some are actually directed to me and to you, but I'll just start with the ones to you. Um, one is from Michael Golden. And he says, I'm just gonna do three at a time that way, because even if we don't get to answer them, it's good for them to be on record since they it could generate thought for the rest of the audience. So Michael Golden asks, aren't the current level of state-sponsored and other violence against Black people, incarceration, economic constraints, et cetera, examples of the capture death aspect in Patterson's argument. And that's just the first. The other one's from Feroz Manji. Brilliant presentation, thank you. Should we not make a distinction between pessimism and hope? And uh, he continues, uh, we need to start from the point not of slavery or black. We need to start from the point of view of us being human and the denialism this is associated with. And an anonymous attendee basically says, Afro-pessimism seems less interested in determining likely outcome versus pr providing a heuristic to questions how we understand the problems we face politically and socially 
and the solutions offered as reprieve, as the very instruments that sustain regression. It would seem that Afro-pessimism doesn't deny progress or movement, but challenges a desire for progress as an instrument through which co-option can take place. Seems less like a stop sign, but more like an intersection. So those are a few, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop with those and then um, we'll see how the time goes. How it goes. Uh, what, what comes to my mind right away, uh, I almost stop at that uh, first question that, um, that you ask. And the first question takes me back to um, something I ask all the time, not only about Afro-pessimism, but any critical or theoretical disposition um, that the African-American practitioner, the Black practitioner might take. In whose interest is this posture adopted? Who is benefiting from understanding that it is death, social death, metaphorical death? Why is that beneficial? And I have not been able uh, to answer that question. And the reason why I'm asking that question is that death was all too real in the case uh, of uh, the enslaved and in the case of the descendants of the enslaved. And so if that's, if that's so, then it, it, it seems to me there's, there's no reason to retrieve it as an emphasis. And if you do retrieve it as an emphasis, then what, what difference does that make or in whose interest is it, is, it, is it being retrieved? Why is it useful that generation after generation of uh, Black people think of their situation as social death or as a continuation of slavery? Why is that, why is that useful? I think the historical imagination or historical awareness or historical consciousness demands that one have an understanding of one's situation, but as a heuristic device, as a way of, 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 of getting through the world, what, what's, what, what's the usefulness? That's what I would, that's what I would, that's what I would ask in relationship to that question. And the last one about, um, the intersection and not, uh, not, not a stop sign. I think it, 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 it works like this. Once you know that um, you are subject to walking out of your house, this is literally true. I understand this about myself and millions of other black people in the United States. I can walk out of my door, law abiding, tax paying and all the rest of it and not, not come back, not walk back in here. If I run into some hysterical son of a gun with access to a gun who thinks that I have in some way endangered him or somebody who puts me prone and puts his foot on my neck nine minutes that could that could happen to any one of us i understand that so i want to know why it is useful therefore for me to have this image of uh, that kind of vulnerability in my head when it seems to me what I really need alongside it is the power, is the power to resist and belief in the efficacy of that, uh, of that resistance. And that's what I mean when I say 
yes and no. Yes, I understand my situation, but no, in the sense that I resisted and I resented. Yes, I understand that my humanity is called into question. I understand that, but no, at the same time that I am always working against it. And it is this, I don't know if I want to say dialectical movement that I'm talking about, but it is dialogic, right? I mean, it is the saying yes and no. It is the, the mounting, the paradox. That's what, that's what I want to do. And it seems to me that to dwell on those features um, that, that, that emphasize the ways in which I am vulnerable or in a precarious position are not, are not helpful. I mean, those images uh, don't, uh, don't help me or I can, I cannot, I cannot um, sustain in a kind of healthy self-regard that particular uh, self-image all the time. I mean, it has to be, has to be balanced with, uh, with something else. You know, what you just said <laughs> reminds me of um, when I was in graduate school, I took a seminar, it was on Heidegger, and the professor um, was bringing up when Heidegger talked about death as forming the subjectivity of the self through care. And as he asked each person, and each of them thought about their own death. And I thought, this is weird. So when he came to me, I said, you know, I don't relate to this. You know, when I face death situations, and I have faced death situations, mm. the, the first thing that went through my mind when I was an adolescent was, and it sounds really crazy, but and it's, a, it's a paradox. If I die, my mother would kill me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it struck me that yeah. when, when I became a parent, the oh. first Thing that went through my mind always right. was about my wife and children yeah. or, and, or before my cousins. And when I read like Harriet Jacobs, yeah. the issue for Harriet Jacobs wasn't her death in and of itself. It was about her children yeah. and her relationship to them. Okay. And even, yeah, and even, yeah, and even the later Douglas in the Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, the way he talked about Harriet Bailey, his mother, is linked to this. So it's it struck me there's something problematic about adapting as the model, not only of what a human being is, but this self-centered substance model instead of the relational model through which one understands meaning through communities. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. And yes. yeah, so, you know, but as you were saying that, it really struck me, I've never been on a Heidegger wagon. It's always been because I, I just I've been all over the world meeting black. We're just not like that. But but I'm going to read um, a, a three more because they relate to these. One of them um, is the is anonymous. It says the Terry is only white question mark. How is this a conclusion from Afro pessimism? Is this to say when faced with anti black terror, black people are not afraid and fearful of death or that there isn't a particularity to the way we are being killed today? And that's the one I was taking that was geared toward my remarks. Uh, and one is from non-anonymous. This is Cassandra Henderson. Can you speak to the assimilation and adoption of Afro, Afro-pessimism by black people? Or is this solely assigned to European slash Caucasian people? And then anonymous again, another anonymous, I don't you know, says, fetish is often used to describe indigenous West African spirituality and its inextricable placement in their ways of living and or existing. Describing Afro-pessimism as being fetish, like or constantly arriving and never separating, could that be limiting the uses of Afro-pessimism to the academy and those who have proximity to whiteness and disregarding its promotion of urgent critical thought and self-reflection in fugitive, fugitive mo movements? And so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm, and in use or tense. When I, I'm just gonna say briefly, when I talked about ontological terror, mm -hmm. my point was, if you can experience terror 
then it's pretty clear that the ontological standpoint cannot be simply those who terrorize you. It means you have a point of view. And so the logic that disavoids you having a point of view fail to understand that if they're correct, you should not be able to experience terror. That was the point I was making. So the very fact, it's like when I was in Kailiche, South Africa once, and there was an older black man beating his chest saying to me, he's not a human being. I said, if you were really not a human being, you wouldn't be angry. And so that's one. And um, I'll leave the others. And there's a question from Saidea Hartman, which we can come to after those. And I'll see how the time is, okay? Okay. So what, what, was, it, what was the first one there? In that group of questions, I think you answered that about terror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the one I, I interpreted as directed to me when I was making my remarks about ontological terror. And the question about uh, fetish. Yeah, um, that yeah, that one I'll repeat it. Fetish is often used to describe indigenous West African spirituality and its inextricable placement in their ways of living and or existing. And this person says, describing, uh, I think this person is interpreting a different way than what we were talking about in psychoanalytical forms of fetish, but yeah. describe, yeah, describing Afro-pessimism as being fetish, this person says, um, basically like or constantly arriving and never separating, could that be limiting the uses of Afro-pessimism to the academy and those who have proximity to whiteness? Um, I find it a little tricky because all the Afro-pessimists are basically narrow academics. But, but anyway, exactly right. I, I know no Afro pessimists outside the academy. That's yeah. exactly in, in people who are actually quite well off, actually. I mean, they're professors who are doing, who are tenured uh, and, and doing quite well. I don't know any pessimists, any Afro pessimists outside that, uh, outside that context. So the answer to that question is that's, that's where the Afro pessimism is uh, is 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 embedded. It's embedded in the academy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and that point about fugitivity. I know we're running out of time. One of the things I would say briefly is there's a reason why all fugitives don't want to remain fugitives. There's yeah. there's this not only the romanticization of death but of fugitivity. But what a lot of a lot of these folks never do is actually study fugitive communities. Fugitive communities are communities in states of war. That's why they are authoritarian. And this gets back to the point about politics and governing. You know, I mean, are you really free when you're under the yoke of an authoritarian who's simply to protect you? Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, so, but, but, but that's a whole other debate, but we're, we're running out of time. So I'll go to uh, uh, Saidea's question. Hi, Saidea. Professor Spillers, Thank you for your insightful lecture. What about the tradition of African writers like William Sassine, Sony Labu Tansi, Yambo Oluguem, and Amadou Karuma, who have been described as Afro pessimists by African literary and cultural critics? How might this complicate the matter of genealogy and or expand the domain of thought? Perhaps introduce dark laughter and satire and boy, there are so many others. I, I must, I, what I'll do is I'll just simply read them out and, okay. right. and you could just choose one because as I said, I'd like for these folks' voice to be heard. So I'll yeah. just read them out and then we'll wrap up. One person says, I'm very interested in hearing more about Dr. Spillers and Dr. Gordon's thoughts on Afro-pessimism's engagement with Fanonian revolutionary theory and Marxist theory and the relationality and or difference between the worker, the enslaved and the colonized and historical materialism as a method and how that might differ from the ontological approach. And then there's an anonymous, that was an anonymous, another anonymous attendee. What role does myth play in Afro-pessimist thought? Oh, that's juicy, but we don't have much time, but we'll, we have to say to be continued, but how can we avoid romanticizing origins on one hand and appropriation on the other? And from J. Cameron Carter, hi, it's great to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, our brother, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My two professor spillers further extend comment on this point about more in the fetish that Professor Gordon brings up. Specifically, I'm curious to hear you further elaborate upon idolatry, which I want to link to the historical production of or innovation of religion. 
I ask this especially given that historically the discourse of fetish as Professor Charles Long deeply elaborates, emerges in fact in the 15th century by the Portuguese in the production of epidermal racialized blackness. The fetish discourse, which is imposed on the African arrests the very dynamism you have movingly spoken of. My question to restate it in short is about religion and how Afro-pessimism may be understood within the very production of fetish religion as a specific innovation of racial capitalist modernity. Might you comment on this? Thank you very <laughs> for, for your fine talk. And I'll just read, read, I'll just read two more uh, because, uh, you know, they're great. They're great. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, there seems to be a conflation with Calvin Warren's Black nihilism and Afro pessimism. Okay. <laughs> and then there is another anonymous, Dr. Spillers and Dr. Gordon, the uselessness is that liberalism and postmodern discourse and other forces seek to deny the reality of black death, vulnerability on top of subscribing failed ideology as black salvation and resistance. Afro pessimists fights, pessimism fights the romanticization of resistance, not forwarding its impossibility, just raises the bar for our own sake. And uh, Dr. Spillers and Dr. Oh, that person said that. And uh, Finally, the reification of color, its conversion and ontological one into the politics of identity formation lies at the heart of our dehumanization, doesn't it? Agree or disagree? And I'll just do one more because the person has the name called Camille Feelings. Is this position by the Afro-pessimist then some kind of badass sounding thing? <laughs> Something that mirrors on the surface some of the BA things apparently done during the 60s by BLA, you know, and the Panthers. Is this also about making funky a part of academics that sounds fatalistic and tough? Willerson seems to reference Asada a lot in relation to his own Afro-pessimist thoughts. Just curious. There are more, there's more, but I think we're, because we're running out of time, I will stop there, but thank you all. And for the last one, yes, this is being recorded. Yeah. So. Hortense, it'll be you, and then I'll take it back to Ian Reed. Well, thank you uh, very much, Lewis, for uh, fielding uh, these really rich and strange questions. I, mean, I just could not imagine about 50% of the questions that uh, were asked would have been generated from, from the things that we were talking about uh, here today. Um, Sadia's question about um, what about um, those African writers and uh, their Afro pessimist disposition? Um, yeah, I don't know what to I don't know what to uh, think about that. I would say that um, I would have to know what makes them uh, Afro-pessimists, or I would say, as Lewis said at the beginning of this uh, presentation, there's Afro-pessimism and then there is uh, being pessimistic. I think they really are two different things, right? I mean, I think one can be pessimistic about something without Afro-pessimism. I, mean, I regard one of them uh, as um, an ideological position taking and uh, the other, uh, a disposition that one might adopt in the course of things that might go along with uh, hope and optimism and cheer and, 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 and all of the rest of it, right? Yeah, I see those as, as, as really two different problems. So that I would say in relationship to the Afro-pessimist question and the African writer, maybe it's like that, 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 that I would have to know um, what Sadia means in the case of the writer to say what I thought about uh, their use of the term or their application of some of the ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I often think about is the blues, because it's interesting, the blues is a music 
that is very mature in which the blues singer sings of suffering and pain, but simultaneously agency and activity, especially when I listen to Dinah Washington or I listen to Bessie Smith, there's a way, and, and Angela Davis has written about this, that challenges in a way, because the blues is always challenging uh, this very notion of ontology. And in fact, it, it's always struck me, I love what Nishitani, Kaiji Nishitani says about this. He says, the problem with ontology is it covers reality. <laughs> but so one of the things I'd like to say as we come out is, you know, there are people when they're young, they're older. Mm -hmm. And when they're older, they're younger. Mm -hmm. And it's because throughout, they continue to be wise. So thank you, Hortense, for your wisdom. <laughs> thank you so much, Lewis. It's wonderful to see you. Great to see you. And great, yeah. Let's do it again. Let's, ah, oh, yes, right. We got, a, we got a little old soul riff there. Let's do it yeah, again. Let's do it again. <laughs> so go ahead, Ian. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been such a delight. It's been lovely. Get... Thank you. It, it has been. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. I'd like to thank our two distinguished guests today on behalf of Soki University of America and the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights. Dr. Hortense J. Spillers provided perceptive observations on, of Afro-pessimism of answers that clarify not only her creative positions, but open the door to new questions and paradoxes. Discussion moved in breathtaking directions from history to philosophy to sociology and literary theory. We span geographic spaces from the Americas to the Caribbean to Africa and temporal spaces from the 15th century to the 21st. Again, we celebrate Dr. Spiller's lifetime achievement as a scholar, teacher, and public intellectual as recognized just last month by our new membership into the Academy of the Arts and Sciences. Dr. Lewis R. Gordon brings decades of research into the topic of Afro-pessimism, brilliantly reminding us that no human being is a closure. In fact, he asks us to consider the starting point of human existence, its anchors. And one of the many intriguing questions he asked was what kinds of political commitments are needed to transcend the Eurocentrism embedded in some theory of black life and thought. His wonderful questions to Dr. Spillers enriched the event enormously. Finally, our gratitude to the nearly 400 audience members who gave us an hour and a half of, of their time today, including our esteemed alumni. We hope to see you back at future Rare Center events, including more discussion on this topic. Dr. Spillers and Dr. Gordon, it's been a, a wonderful pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. And we hope you have a wonderful night. And for everyone else in the United States and across the, the globe uh, with us today, please take care and be well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Be safe, healthy, and find moments of joy. <laughs> Thank you. Remember your humanity. Yeah. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.